and welcome to Coffee and Geography, where my guests and I geek out about the world and everything on it, discovering that we are all geographers in some way, shape or form. I am your host, Kit, and my pronouns are they, them or she, her. So settle down with a brew, hit that subscribe or follow button and enjoy the listen. Hi everybody, welcome back to Coffee and Geography. I've got someone with me who I first saw, no I can't remember where I met you first, I think I might have met you at the GA conference virtually first, then you appeared on our TV screen, Uh uh, Royal Institute (laughs) of Science Christmas Lectures, Uh, but Professor Chris Jackson, I finally got on to you. No, I know, you know, I I kind of moved countries in that time, I moved Within the UK, I, I left academia. I've changed jobs, but you've still found me. It's yeah, I know. I'm no, I'm no stalker. <laughs> I'm no stalker. <laughs> right. For, for those of you who do not know who uh, Chris is, Chris is director of sustainable geoscience with Jacobs, an organisation that supports sustainable and inclusive futures in fields such as, and there's a big list, but such as advanced they manufacturing. Have, they have, a, yeah, they have a long list of things. Yeah, they claim energy they environment, do. health and yeah, life sciences, natural yeah. security. No, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and you are co and we're definitely going to talk about this because the reason why you set this up was brilliant um and that is your co-finder of something called earth archive which is spelled a-r-x-i-v which is a non-profit preprint server for the earth sciences and uh, also uh chris a, a bit of a work which is so so important is that you're trustee of the uh the cowrie found uh, scholarship foundation and that raises money for financially disadvantaged black british students to attend university so yeah we'll talk about that a bit later but uh, i love what you put here you're a runner and you do post a lot about that on twitter which is great a lapsed knitter <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh, you and, know uh, you see we can only be so long right so yeah <laughs> i know yep and, uh, and i love i love what you put here you put here the twitter trolls will tell you everything else you need to know about him <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i'm my yeah. mum because my mum will tell you the truth right so that's the that's the big problem so it's either trolls or my mum <laughs> oh, lovely <laughs> oh well I hope well, we'll get your mum to listen hi chris's mum uh, he's, yeah. he's, he's, sorry, he's, a, he's a lovely lad he's doing he's, he's doing boy. well your boy he's um, doing well your boy <laughs> <laughs> so then chris um yeah so uh welcome have you got a a, a brew with you this evening or do you i, I stick actually water this time I've, got, of night? No, I've actually got a beer but it's a non-alcoholic beer oh um yeah I've, I've drunk i've drank two of them and the reason being is i've been hitting it pretty hard the last two nights <laughs> and kind of getting carried away with it being a bank holiday weekend so and i know i've got to go back to work tomorrow morning so i was thinking uh-huh. tonight I, I still you know it's kind of trying to wean myself off so i'm having a non-alcoholic beer it's too late to, for me now for tea yeah well partly not because it'll keep me awake it's just i'm i just don't really like drinking them that late at night you know i'm the sort of person who could have like espresso put in through a vein while they <laughs> sleep it does it does has no effect on me caffeine so <laughs> It's like that Simpsons meme, isn't it? With Barney saying, "Just hook it straight into my veins." That's no, like, exactly. Know. Just bypass all the, uh, you know, the kind of all the unnecessary fuss of putting it in a mug. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm still hooked on all the stuff that um, uh, a previous Twitter guest, uh, Twitter guest, previous, I've got it on my mind now. Previous jo- coffee and geography guest, Hermione email was giving me all this like Chinese brews. Um, oh, right, uh, and this is. And, and Hermione, I do apologise if I'm butchering this pronunciation, but it's P-U-E-R-T, so P-U-E-R-H-T. So I'm not quite Ooh. sure exactly what I'm drinking, Hermione, oh, but right. you need to tell me. But it's delicious. Yeah, it's one of the yeah. tea bags she gave me <laughs> so, um, when we met at the GA conference. Um, yeah, so, oh, so Chris, you say you've been all around the places. You've been abroad. You've you've been in and out of academia, stuff like that. Are you, are you a... Are you back in Stockport now? Are you in Stockport? I am. I'm in, I'm in a place called Marple, not far away from Stockport. So mm-hmm. I'm onto the edges of the Peak District. Oh. Um, but yeah, I have I have moved around quite a bit, I guess. And maybe, well, and in fact, this is true, that this is the closest I've probably lived back to where I'm from since mm. I left home. And that's not necessarily by design because I wanted to be near a home or anything. It's just you know, the journeys that life takes you on has kind of led me to be living about 40 miles away uh, or so from where I grew up. So, um, yeah, but in the, in the meantime, you know, I've been, a, I've been a lot of places, seen a lot of stuff, just getting old, but <laughs> it's all been good. It's all been good. Yeah, because the question I always ask people, and, and people will answer this in so many different fabulous ways, so I'll be interested to see what you come up with it, is that um, 
is basically how the locations you've been in has formed your current day identity. So yeah. for me, people people in the podcast know that I originally are from Essex and I moved up to Norfolk and then I've got American family as well, well, that kind of stuff. And I'm half Cockney, so which I can apparently I keep <laughs> apologizing for. But um, so so you've kind of like come like yeah. circle back, back to where we are. So can you, do you think, okay, so I was, the, what you've just told me, let's try and rephrase this question then. So the identity that you had when you first moved away from this area, and you've yeah. gone and done all the wonderful stuff, and now you've come back to it. Can you describe to us perhaps how different you might be as a person now between the Chris that left home all those years ago, yeah. between the Chris's where you are now? Yeah, I think, I mean, geography has a huge part to play in that, of course. Mm. Because, um, you know, settlements are of different sizes. They have different um, types of cultures within them based often on, you know, the size, the bigger the place, the more different people are. So I think that's the that's what's really changed me and shaped me is by going to different places you know London a city much larger than where I grew up Manchester where I studied for my undergraduate and my PhD again much larger than Derby where I grew up so mm. being exposed to a large group of people who are quite different to me and, and that's not to say you know and this this North South Delight thing like you know you know, being mixing with a large group of people in Manchester would be appreciably different from London. I don't think that was true for me at all. You know, I think you, you meet yeah. good people and not so good people in, in in everywhere. But certainly, just being exposed to a, a different group of people uh, in those large cities was really formative for me. And I, and I think it's I think it really just made me realise all the axes of identity that weren't apparent where I grew up by by virtue of the fact it was a relatively small place and then quite, mm. quite homogeneous. So I think that's definitely, you know, for me in the UK, it shaped me and, and hopefully made me more open-minded and more self-aware of myself and, and how to relate to others. I think going overseas as well, I lived in um, in Norway in a place called Bergen for about two and a oh, half years. Amazing. Yeah, and, yeah, and in Oslo as well for a bit of time. And, and again, going somewhere like Norway, which socioeconomically is 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 is, is so much um, more advanced than the UK, or it's all you know, people are typically wealthier there. So even the kind of lower socioeconomic groups there are still, you know, in my view, what you'd call middle class here in the UK. And even going there, where you would think, I don't know, you you you'd probably get a bit of a warped view about what world was the world was like. I think it made me realise how equitable some societies could be so you know mm. that norwegian society seemed incredibly equitable to me and therefore quite desirable but then as a geographer or you know as a i don't know as a geologist i'm a geographer i'm gonna say i am but as a geographer you realize that the geography of norway and and the and the economics of norway mean that it can have a very equitable society mm. rather than it being a you know a kind of inherent goodness of the people there that believe in in equity it's just because it's a very wealthy country with not many people in it <laughs> so right. you know yeah. that, and and you know one reason it's very wealthy is because they've got this huge endowment of oil and gas and so i think i think again even going to those places has shaped me that it's made me maybe think more deeply about why places or or how they are and how people are you know the way the way they are and, and those the things that have shaped them and, and their opinions so that's been beneficial to me definitely yeah it's, what's really fascinating about what you're saying is that i've had a few guests on who've who've said kind of slightly different but similar things to what you have about like oh you know i've I've lived in london but also live in this places and the people are like this compared to like this but then you say that in your experience they've been but it's really interesting and fascinating how different our own personal experiences can be and that's why it's so important to have nuanced discussions i guess because everybody's experience yeah. can be different yeah, and I think I think you know, the, so the one thing I have talked about on social media before, probably not as loudly as I would care to, because <laughs> I don't want to get cancelled by the North of England. But there's this kind of is this like vision that the North of England is full of friendly, warm-hearted people who, you know, take milk bottles in for the neighbours and say hello to everybody at the bus stop, and everybody in London's full of people scowling at each other on the tube. <laughs> but actually, it's complete nonsense because depending on who you are, so as a black person being in West London is a much more comfortable and anonymous 
life to live than being where I live now in Marple, which is very homogenous, it's very white area and you stand out like a sore thumb and so how good or otherwise a place is or how nice a place is I think has more to do with who you are than it does to do with any inherent sort of attitude of the people there and like I said I mean a lot of people would argue against me go oh no everybody in the north of England's nice because of X and 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 but I, I, I just I just wholeheartedly disagree because it's the experience you have in those places yeah. which is more important than just some sort of like, you know, <laughs> some marketing slogan you have about come and welcome to the friendly north you know, or wherever yeah. it might be. Yeah, and that's really really interesting. And I, I can't, I can't for life of me remember which guest was said it, but but they were definitely white. You know, who said said that they have a more friendly experience with folks up in the north than they do down in the south. And of course, that matters a lot as well. The kind of the 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 you know the person themselves you know and whether they whether they're part of like you say you go to west london and you feel like you've got people there and you've got people you feel you could talk to you connect to and stuff like that and you go to a place which is very very white and it's a little bit different for you and no exactly i think we've got to talk about we've got the lived experiences is so so important it's very complicated isn't it because you know geography people move between geographies they as they move around like we just started talking about they pick up and drop off different bits of their personality in response to, you know, where they are and who they're interacting with. Mm. So there's no definites in my mind. I've never experienced that. So I think you need to kind of go into those places with an open mind, engage in trying to accept those places, what they are, but equally be mindful of the fact that they may not be de facto really good for you or, or just, right. you know, they're, not, they're just not going to be great. Yeah. yeah. I've definitely had some of those experiences where, I've been to places outside of my comfort zone, but going, as you said, going to those places with an open mind, it's, I felt they, that has been really good for me. So for example, I've talked a lot on this podcast about going to Malawi in 2013 as part of a teacher Mm -hmm. exchange. And I felt way outside of my comfort zone, but uh, the experience was a life changing experience. I'll never, ever forget. And I've got like really close friends now from Malawi um and um one one of them i've had on the podcast before and and it was experiences like that chris where i felt like i i thought this discomfort as long as you have as long as you're healthy with it and you don't have a toxic mindset for it it's actually really really good for you as a human being to like have these experiences and and have those fresh perspectives and like kind of get pushed out uh yeah pushed out through your comfort zone and making sure that not everybody is going to see the world as you do and especially with me with like massive amounts of white privilege and I've got and I've got residue male privilege as well because you know I may although I'm a trans woman I've still got a legacy of male privilege you know and then when I've got to know people who are in the queer community and stuff like that I still continue to have like privilege checks and these discussions I I never thought of it that way you know and it's nice and as a geographer I love it I absolutely love it it is difficult though isn't it because like I think when you're when you're moving outside of your comfort zone, everybody's got different um, appetites for risk, haven't they? So everybody's got boundaries. Is it so yep. it, is, it, is, it is difficult to know, you know, a situation that I might be comfortable in might be really oppressive and difficult for somebody else, isn't it? So it is, it is very much the call of the individual to decide, you know, what is a safe situation or mm. an unsafe situation and, and having some autonomy around that decision is what's really, really important. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's very, very true. And I, I find myself being a little bit more considerate. I was going to say careful, but that's not the right word. I think a little bit more considerate now before I speak out. I mean, that's not necessarily speaking out on like trans rights and stuff like that, but just in any issue, I always think to myself, okay, well, Kit, before you, because I'm someone to give hot <laughs> takes. I give hot takes all the time, right? And like, and uh, people follow me on Twitter. I was like, oh, my God, here, co- here Kit goes again. Um, you know, but especially when I'm out and I'm with people and I'm working with young people and students, I'm like, OK, before you step back, consider, right, then then what? And ask questions as well. Yeah, like, yeah. So what do you yeah. mean? Oh, that's an interesting thing. And then I kind of like go back to when I was a teacher and like the best lessons were some of those lessons where I used to say to the students like, that's really interesting. And I want you to, what do you mean by that? Or what do you think about that? And then 
those discussion did dialogue dialogue kind of lessons were always the most fun in my opinion yeah, they would yeah. fail off stead but <laughs> you know but <laughs> they were the best ones you know so um I, w- I want to move in on kind of like similar to that is that you've got uh, yeah let's go and talk about the Cowrie Scholarship Foundation this is such a good um, initiative so um, yeah so you're a trustee of this place so tell us a little bit about that because I think there's a well the fact that the, that stuff like this is absolutely necessary and we need it is yeah you know a shame on one hand but on the other hand I think this is a fantastic thing what what made you want to get involved with the um, with the scholarship yeah so um, I mean Professor um, Richard Refo at Southampton he set it up in the summer of uh, 2020 so in the teeth of the kind of Black Lives Matter movement if you, if you mm. want to call it that and, and you know and it was this idea that education could have a really transformative um, effect on anybody uh, but you know we have very poor representation of black yeah. British students at UK universities and certainly um, a certain set of universities and um, one of the barriers to those students going to university was financial. It wasn't mm. kind of a lack of aspiration. You know, finances was a really important aspect. So Richard set this up and the idea was to try and fund 100 black working class British students through university um, or higher education in the in the next 10 years, so through to 2030. So nice. that was, you know, Richard sort of contacted me. It turns out he he knew somebody who knew my wife's auntie. <laughs> so it, was really, it was really bizarre. I got Love it, that happens. My, my wife's auntie was like, I met somebody who knows this guy called Richard Refo wants to talk to you. Um, <laughs> so, so that's how I got into it. So then I was asked to be a trustee. I, I said yes, and I didn't actually know what a trustee was. I'd heard of it, and yeah. then I didn't Google it before I said, yes, I'll do it. And then I was a trustee. And then so I've been helping um, run Cowrie for the last three years in so you know that, and the the idea is that the two there are two parts to Clary. One is getting universities to waive fees for students mm. uh, for those Black British students um, to get them to waive fees, and the other bit was then to raise private money to then pay the stipends. So that you know what we what we were not about was just getting the fees waived so that the students would have to still find all of the stipend. We weren't right. around. We weren't yeah. about just giving the students the stipends and then meaning um, you know and then they'd still have to find the um the fee so we wanted a like a full ride as they call it in the US mm. and we had a number of other things we have a mentorship program in place and the students get financial advice and there's a number of other things which are focused not simply on the financial element they are related to ensuring that with the financial burden alleviated those students can also not just you know, survive at university, they can thrive, thrive they can actually yeah. maximise their potential. So that's that's where we've we've done. So we've got a hundred, I think it's hundred and four or hundred and five committed places from university. So we've we've hit our target in three years. And then but to unlock that funding from the university or the provision from the university, we need that private funding. So we have to basically do that match funding. So we're doing lots of um uh, work around that but at the moment we've got let me I'm going to get the number wrong here I think we've got about by the end of this year we'll have about 35 of the 100 students in university so we're already on year two so some of the oh. students we support in the first year have just finished their second years uh, and they're in a range of things right so um, in midwifery in electrical engineering in journalism like so like completely broad range of topics at very very different types of universities um so not you know we're not just like you've got to go to oxbridge or imperial mm. you've got to do maths and physics and it's like you t- you do what you need to do and you go where you need to be to be the best you can be and we will support you in that so we're agnostic about um you know when we because there is a selection process there's an application process selection process which is incredibly traumatic to read about you know the the, the need of, of these mm. students so there's there's lots of sensitivity around that but yeah we we, we just want to support the best students to go and maximize their potential so it's, it's been great yeah mm. i want to yeah i wanted you to talk about this because um part of the program that i work for <clears throat> out of the university of Stanglia is all about it's it's the office for students uniconnect 
um, program, um, which you may have heard of. And, and like, it's part of our job is to work with, with students who have, as you say, poor access into higher education. And, and we're moving into a phase now of, of strategic outreach. And uh, so, and one of the, you know, all these groups of people. So we've got children from military families because they move around. They don't have any stability because they move around a lot. So we've got, <clears throat> you know, um, students of color. And so, folks, um, I'm going to make sure that all my colleagues at the UniConnect program all around the country hear about what you're doing, Chris, because I think if they can, any of them from any of those partnerships can like find out what you're doing and who knows, they might be able to support in some way, shape or form. Yeah, no, and we, yeah, we've built really strong links with a number of different other kind of funding bodies and also large companies. So Jacobs, the company I work for, mm. have been incredibly generous. Um, and it, it, yeah, so it's, it's, it's going really, really well. I, I actually finished as a trustee later this year. Oh, um, okay. So that'll be my three years up. So we're currently looking for new trustees. If anybody who's listening yep. in wants to get involved, because it is really, you know, it's really enriching for you. And, and and one reason it is is because you know you're doing something which is really needed and yep. really and really necessary. I've got a num- number of people spring to mind. I think would make them excellent, but they're so so busy with 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 stuff as well. Yeah, um, you know, they're not necessarily positive. these people, but we've but there are so many fantastic, um, you know people out there who are doing their stuff i mean one of my favorite and she knows this i've said to her many many times one of my favorite favorite people in the entire world is a friend of mine called akira williams who runs the the voices project and she was the co-founder of rerouted so this is in london about about um student voice of color um and like trying to you know improve their circumstances and get getting through some and oh these these human beings like akira and she, and uh, Shanique at the Royal, Geogra- uh, Royal Geographical Society. Yeah. I have so much love for these people. Yeah, no, they're, they're, and they're doing it, like, often, usually in their own time outside of their they are. duties. It's kind of, yeah. it, is a, it is a huge effort anyway. And I think, you know, certainly from, from my experience, joining a charity at the start of its, you know, at its, its, in its initiations, doubly difficult because Uh, you're setting up the laws and the regs and you know there's lots of kind of failures almost or inefficient ways you do things and it and it is it is it is really challenging but it is very fulfilling because then you know hopefully when you leave you've you've helped improve Mm. build and help and or help improve uh, you know the charity and then it's going to go on to great things awesome right i've got a question to ask you chris Go ahead. Have, have you heard of uh, the Roots Journal? I have. Right. So this is a journal for for student geographers. Um, yes. And and it was it was and I think this is right up your street because I would like to talk about Earth Archive. Um, and it's fantastic. So it's a stu- it's a it's been put together by geography academics and teachers, and it's all about having six formers, particularly and undergraduate students, able to submit their work to Roots Journal and have it potentially have it published. Yeah. Which yeah. is such an amazing freaking idea because there are so many amazing youngsters out there who've got some fantastic ideas and we know that, you know, and you I remember doing this myself as like as when I was an undergrad, I I the University of Stanley got me to work on this like brand new data set that they had come up with from the climatic research unit. And like I had, uh, I had the absolute honor of having um, Professor Jean Palutikoff as my advisor, uh, and and like, and she was getting me to do all this stuff. And then I find out that later on, and I, I was an undergrad; it was just a dissertation. But like, some of my work that I did in my dissertation had gone on to kind of like further some research at the Climatic Research Unit. I got a little footnote, which was nice. But um, yeah, and I was thinking, oh, if only I could have had that like <laughs> published in something, that would be yeah. really nice. And like. You know, Kit Rackley as part of the climatic research unit at the UEA. That would have been quite nice, but I'm yeah, no, it is. It is no, but it's yeah, but it, you know, those things kind of throw my cats around. Um, it, it is, <laughs> you know, it is, it is. Um, it can act as like a kind of stimulus to go on or continue in research if you if you can see that your work can go out to a wider audience and people can appreciate that work and you can get feedback outside of your supervisor yeah. about that work from a reviewer, let's say, or an editor. I think I think those are really good things to happen. Yeah. And I want to get um I mean I've already spoken to a few people who are peer reviewers on Roots. 
Um, but I need to get more. I mean, I've spoken to Katie Water, who's uh, one of my first guests on this podcast. But Lizzie, I know you listen, uh, Dr. Lizzie Russian. You need to come on this podcast, please, friend of mine, <laughs> and talk about all this. But yeah, Chris, the reason why I mention it is because I want people to know about it, but I want to segue into why you wanted to. And this is a fantastic, well, the reason why you, ha- you, ha- you felt the need to do this, obviously, is is really important. But I thought yeah. it's a fantastic thing that, that you've done and that you're co-founder of uh, Earth Archive, which is a preprint server for the Earth Sciences. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I know the story because I followed it yeah. on, on Twitter. But, yeah, t- tell people who don't know, like, why you felt so passionate that this was this was a need. Because I know you were exceptionally frustrated uh, with what, yeah. <laughs> everything oh, behind this. I'm exceptionally frustrated about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Including the cat being on your, <laughs> on your lap. <laughs> Um, so um, preprints are um, like a version of a manuscript which is um, you can make available on a thing called a preprint server so ahead of publication or instead of publication and there's, there's, they co- preprints can be in various you know shapes and forms but essentially they're, they're kind of a pre-publication or sin publication version of a paper and it can go on the preprint server it can be reviewed by the broader community whilst the paper is going through full journal-led peer review it's also a way of making science much more open so you can see because, you know, you've got multiple versions on the preprint server, how that preprint has changed as a function of the feedback mm. being given to it via the reviewers. So it gives a degree of transparency to science. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I didn't know any of that <laughs> before I started Earth Archive. Um, and I think it was born out of a frustration around the slowness of the of the peer review and publication mm. process as led by journals and also elements of, of um, you know, the, the review process being rather closed as well. Yeah. Um, so I, that kind of deeply appealed to me. There was this kind of slightly disruptive thing which we could, you know, get involved in and it had all of these benefits that you could, you know, you could pre-print a paper whilst it's going through this one-year-long journey through the, the, the journal. That pre-print could be there and able... Uh, for anybody to read and you know people who are going to interview you for a job could read the preprint and see what you're about because the paper's not out yet so I I, I liked that empowerment of the yeah. researcher and the, and the and the authors and and them having that degree of ownership over their work about how and where and when they share that work because before that it wasn't as formally structured you know you could throw it on your blog but it's not the same as having it indexed properly yeah. under a, a preprint server it turns out we weren't the first people to think of this of course because it all came about because archive had been around for like a few decades so archive is the equivalent for, for physics computer science um and maths and so on so you know it's a very old thing that we just invented one for the earth and planetary sciences so that is kind of theme but but that that was why i got involved in it and and i and I don't know. Like I said, lots of things frustrate me. I think I just like feeling active, and sometimes when I'm frustrated by something, feel like I'm doing something. And that that Earth Archive was definitely one of those those things where you're flying by the seat, your pants a little bit mm. because you're sort of learning as you're doing it. But everybody's like, "Oh, speak to Chris because he knows loads about prints." <laughs> I'm like, you know, flicking through preprint 101. <laughs> you know, like, work out what they are. And, and like you know like i said with carrie like you know you fail and then you, you refine something then you advance and then maybe yeah. you fail again and and that's just i guess it sounds a bit cheesy to say but that's where the growth is you know is in those it's in those 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 those, those failures sometimes and yeah um scary though they are so um yeah that was that's the archive so it's yeah it's been going how many years now is it six years five years six i think it's i think we started in 2017 I think. Mm, wow. So it's been going a long time and uh um yeah, it's it's doing well. It's doing really well. And there's a committed core of people who support it. There's um a community awareness and a community acceptance of, around it now. We converted some preprint hostile people to being uh preprint positive nice. and being really engaged in it. Um and I yeah, I'm I'm really I'm really pleased that I've managed to play a small part in in that. Yeah, it's. I always thought that there was a stepping stone to to that access of that kind of ac- sense of academia that was missing for a lot of people. I mean, I'm not. I mean, I, I'm not a prolific 
academic at all in this respect. You know, I've I've got lots of ideas and most of my stuff end up on my blog or they end up on teaching blogs, you know, and I have a few things um, published. Mostly they're in, in journals towards teachers, really. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I feel that for someone like me who's got all these crazy ideas and I want to get out there and I do want them challenged, I do want them critiqued, I do want them reviewed, I feel like where I could have these to a wider audience, like you just said, like I, I just don't seem to have accessibility to that at all. Yeah, that's what you need is, you know, sometimes you build it and they will come and sometimes they don't come at all, right? So yeah, you never really yeah. Know. But if you, if you make something, you know, it's not like we did any market research before we be, be, built with our company, right. like go around and say like, do people want this? And how many people? We were just said, well, you know, this exists in these other disciplines. It was in a very, it was in a moment, I think in uh, in academic publishing where, whether it was open research or open science or preprints, whatever it was, there was this, or, you know, research culture, research environment. There was just a general conversation going on around, you know, the agency people had or felt that they didn't have around their work or how they were being treated and, and, the, and the kind of way in which the kind of slow glacial pace of journal-led publishing was impoverishing certain people because they couldn't get their work out quick enough to support them in their next career step. Those conversations were happening. So we were like, well, let's just let's just go for it and see if we can we can make it work. And we were supported by some really, you know, Tom Narok was mm. co-founder and uh, Bruce Caron as well. So yeah, you're really inspirational people and it was really fun to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you and as I say you're 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 giving you're giving that um, access to a really important um, part of the process that these people wouldn't get access to over, you know, because as you say, like learning from mistakes, failures, other people's um, ideas and just that ferment, that intellectual f- ferment is just so powerful. And not to have yeah. so many more people have access to that. It's just, just fantastic. But like I said, it is slightly terrifying because people do kind of assume, you know, what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. None that's of us know what we're doing. <laughs> that's my whole life, though, you know. So I, I, and you, I think you have to be careful, don't you? Because yeah. if you genuinely don't know anything about something and by doing it, you're going to harm a bunch of people, then you probably shouldn't do it. Right, yeah. You know, so I think there's, there is, you know, people who are complete egomaniacs will just be like, well, I can do this thing even though I've never done it before and everybody will be, love it and I'll be great. But equally you know know your limits and know what the risk reward is and and what the damage could be caused you know with earth archive i was like well you know what would be the worst that could happen and i guess you know on reflection we could have put back preprinting the earth sciences decades if we just screwed it up yeah we could have we could have done it really poorly and a lot of people went well these people set this thing up and it's rubbish and then that's it, you know, we'd have, we'd have ruined it for other people mm. who wanted to bring it forward. Hi folks, a chance for you to recharge your brew, but also a polite prod to remind you that it's so easy to support this podcast. Simply liking, sharing, rating and reviewing means that it will get on more people's radar. Also, there are a few links down in the description which may be of mutual benefit. Please do check them out. But in in credit to you and your colleagues though with it, is though, is that in fact this is a perfect segue, Chris, you've given me. Um, because like it's not like you were on the right at the very start of the Dunning Kruger effect, right? So like the, <laughs> like you had all this enthusiasm. You know, you're all, you've you'd pushed past that, and you recognised that. You know, you've you've got some knowledge, you've got some, you know, and and then you've you've started off building confidence. So you'd you'd pass that toxic part of the dunk. <laughs> thing. But on that note, on that note, let's now have a little bit of fun with those who are right at the very left of the Dunning Kruger oh, effect, no. right? There's the people who think they know it all and then they're at peak inf- of enthusiasm. And that is uh, both you and I get this all the time. And that is the Twitter trolls. Now we could be, we, we could go and be very, you know, cause it does drag me down. Sometimes I do think to myself, what am I doing here and stuff like that. But you know what they say? If you, if you know, if I don't cry, I might as well laugh. So yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think, I think that, you know, I think that, I think Kit, you 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 get a lot more of it than me, and I think certainly, you know, the way the media is at the moment, and, and just, you know, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's just like 
it's just the, the, the thing in the public consciousness for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Mm. You know, and it's like if we were having positive conversations about it, fine, but we're not. And, you know, race and racism was probably like the hot topic in 2020 and it's kind of died off a little bit, but the people are still talking about it. But it's but nobody is willingly coming forward and being like super racist and actually thinking it's okay, whereas transphobia and homophobia and other yeah. manifestations of discrimination against, you know, different sexual and gender identities, that it's like it's fair game. And so yeah. I, I do think I, I do think I've been subjected to it, and, you know, and being sent racist books through the post and being sent, you know, physical violence on videos to your DMs are never, never good, you know, so I'm not, yeah. I'm not dismissing or minimising those things I've been through. Um, I, I just, yeah, I just think it's like, yeah, what do you do? You either cry, you laugh, or you, do you empower yourself with that incoming kind of grief you're getting? And it's 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 not easy. And you can choose, right? You don't have to do one thing all the time. You can, you can choose when and where to engage. Yeah. Well, you had, um, you very, very recently had um, a conversation um with uh, Dr. Adam Levy, one of my favorite, favorite people. I mean, I absolutely love them. They're so brilliant. And I've, I've had conversations with them myself. Um, and yeah, you kind of like we're, we're talking about on the back of particularly like your, your Christmas lectures, which I absolutely yeah. adored and loved. And <clears throat> both my kids, um, even though we had, we had the mini jog for on here, uh, Theo, a minute, you know, before we started everybody. And like, I said, Oh, Theo, do you, do you recognize Chris? It's like, it's on the t-. And then <laughs> no. Theo's like, no, it's like, <laughs> but there you go. Typical eight year old. Um, but, and, and I remember like the, the Twitter for it, that, that, that kicked off after that. Yeah. And, and I, and I remember like one of the threads was particularly long and I was on there going, well, there was like me, you, and a few other people, well, quite a few other people were like, like batting for you and then there was just these people who just had no idea what they're talking about like, but the problem is i think the problem with that though was that it was the kind of perfect storm right 2020 there was that discussion going on around race and racism in the wake of george floyd's murder and then mm. you know some black guy just rap rocks up and he's going to talk about climate change which you know <laughs> the, the confluence of race racism and climate change is probably too much for some <laughs> but it was like it was at a time when and on the subject, and then it was very, very, well, not very, very, it was quite public, right? So I was in a yeah. few national newspapers talking about not just the lectures itself, but the fact I was the first black person in 182 years to, to give a lecture. So that became as much of the story. And, you know, the Christmas lectures might not have been in The Guardian or The Telegraph or The Times, sorry, unless I was in it that year, maybe, right? Yeah. Because they were like, oh, there's this black guy, let's talk to him about that. You know, I don't mean that's disrespect to my my co-host, but I think that that's sort of what one of the stories was, and that was just not acceptable to some people. Yeah, it's, it, just, it was absolutely crazy because, <clears throat> I mean, the way that I brought my kids up, they were just so fascinated in the, the science, things like that, and like, and I thought, but you know, from as a someone who's trained in climate science myself, I thought you did a bloody great job, to be honest. You know, there was not yeah, there was nothing in there that was like so. Qu- I mean, there was a, there was a couple of things which somebody like really, really like really nitpicked with you, and then that's when I went. Oh, was that about the temperature? Was about it? the temperature was thing? It, yeah, like, that, double, yeah. And I was like, oh come on, like yeah, okay, maybe technically you might be right, but come on, we're talking about experienced temperatures. You know, people's perception of temperatures, which is more important than actually what it actually says in the thermometer. And like, even though they got this person, this climate science communicator, like calling them out on this, they're still like, to me, look, oh, you got it wrong. Yeah, like, oh, no, right, fine. This, is, this is the problem, though, wasn't it? Is that, <laughs> you know, that for every one person on Twitter, there's like five of them emailing you and then 10 of them <laughs> yeah. sending you letters at work. And so, yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, I think there's just that, that desire by, people to have their moment in the sun because they're not presenting something or getting that opportunity and you know i think for the most part you can engage in those people in good faith and say right okay there was a mistake there or yeah, we'll yeah. do that differently but it's um i think when it comes to like personal insults then it's oh my god you know, yes. it's, it's harder to engage in, in you know in that because why would you <laughs> Yeah, um, I want. All right, I got. A, I got a quiz for everybody here. A little little tester for you. Sweepstakes, if you like. If I go into my security settings on Twitter, this is so self indulgent. Um, and and right, I go to my block list. Right, folks. I'm not on there, am I? No, well, I'm sure, <laughs> well, I'm maybe no, you're muted. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> right, folks. I want. I want you to tell me what do you think? Right, 
how many accounts have I got blocked? Everybody have a little throw at your radio, would you reckon? Can I guess? Yeah, you can most certainly guess. There's a limit to how many people you can block, isn't there? Is there? Well, I'd, well clearly, I haven't reached that limit. I'm pre- I'm, I thought somebody, <laughs> maybe Ben, my friend, told me there's a limit. I, I don't know. Is it 400? No, it must be more than that. I'm going to go for 1,216. Oh, my God, Chris, you're way off. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> you should block more people. All right, well, yeah. that, right. Are you ready, folks? This is crazy, right? And um, I am the kind of person who will just like if I see people have liked a tweet which is very offensive or very oh, then I will go and I'll go right. Who's like blah 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 blah. Right. Done. Yeah. Done. Right. Ready. Three hundred and sixty-eight thousand seven hundred ninety-two. What? <laughs> You're allowed to do that. Um, wow, slightly cheating. So apparent. So there was. I mean, it doesn't exist now because of the whole Twitter API business. But you could you could sign up to um, like a community block list where people like feed in as if when they block someone, it goes on a block list by bot, and then it you automatically uh, right, goes on your okay. block list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a group of people who were really good group um, who set up a uh, an a- an API thing where if blocking transphobic people. And then, yeah. it, and then between us, like the thousands of us, this this list grew up to like about you know two hundred and fifty thousand people. Um, <laughs> the trouble is with that, and and I do realise that this is a limitation of it. Is that, of course, if you've got a group, you've got a, a group sourced thing like this. If you get one person who takes, you know, because maybe they're they're very vulnerable and they're feeling they just this person they just can't do if they've blocked them straight out then that person ends up on your block list maybe for something that they said which was just a little bit of mis- of mistake you know a mistake so yeah, i've actually yeah, got yeah, people yeah. why are uh, you blocked? exactly why yeah are you blocked? <laughs> no you know. that's the same with me well i don't have the block list thing but it's certainly like if i went to my block list now I'd like 99 percent of people would be like you're on the block list you're on the naughty step for a good reason and the <laughs> You're on the Twitter naughty step wise. Yeah. Whereas there's definitely going to be a few where I'm like, I can't remember blocking you, but I'm sure you're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It's, it's been know. a couple of times where people have accidentally, and, and, I, and like someone's met, like a, a somebody of the geography teach community has messaged me and says, Oh, such and such says that you're, you've blocked them. And like, do you know what? And I'm like, I looked at them and I go down and so I, I don't actually know why. It's just, yeah. it's just been, sometimes people get caught in the crossfire. But in all fairness, Chris, with the amount of stuff that comes up, I think it's better yeah. to wear on the it's, side it's, of caution. I think so as well. Um, yeah. Do you have a um, anybody, any kind of like troll that's just like really made you laugh or just like, I just can't? Like, that's brilliant. So, yeah, there is. So, I mean, there was. This, so I give talks about um, discrimination in science and, 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 and various kind of other kind of talks along those those lines. And I, and I show a slide with some tweets on from when I got announced as the Christmas lecturer, one of them for 2020. And there's a bunch of people saying this is woke, but she's signaling getting a black guy and he's not qualified and everything. There's other standard, oh. standard nonsense. Yeah. Um, but then one person just tweeted, does he look like a scientist without his glasses on? Oh my goodness! <laughs> you know, so it's not like it's not it's not a return. You know, it's not a frequent flyer in terms of the tweets, but it was just it's just one of those ones that's stuck in my mind. So I always show that, and I, you know, I just think it's you know schoolyard insults being tossed about, mm. and the, you know the kind of stereotypical nerd. What would they look like? Oh, he has to wear glasses. So it speaks to a bunch of other things, but that's that's just one that sticks in the mind. <laughs> I think, I think that, I mean, there are, there are some people who, there's definitely a couple of people who I don't really come across anymore, presumably because they've blocked me or I blocked them, who the only time they engaged with you was to disagree mm. or to play devil's advocate. And this, so there was certainly, and you never heard from them any of the time, like when there's just like random mm. nonsense chat or science chat or whatever it is, you never heard from them. And then as soon as there was a certain few things, they would suddenly turn up and, and it would be only be to, to disagree with you. Um, and what was weird is sometimes they weren't just like randos. There were people who you kind of considered friends or at least acquaintances. And you were like, mm. I don't quite know why you did this. Anyway, so they're, they're not around anymore, which is kind of handy um, <laughs> for everybody, for them and for me. <laughs> but yeah, it is. It, it is that is that is kind of a curiosity of mm. social media is that you know sometimes people who otherwise would say to your face they don't and they do it in a kind of rather oblique way mm. online. 
rather I've, than the really awful people who you know yeah. only have access to you online i've i've just i mean it, sometimes you know when i'm having a bad day it's hard especially with the, with the transphobia stuff but but i've <sighs> Sometimes I think the the best quote unquote the best ones I've had are ones which have intersected with particular say transphobia and Star Trek, right? Because I'm because I'm a member of the Trek. Tre- there's the, these these people who come on and and say uh, when they're pushing back about like Trek being like inclusive and especially during Star Trek Discovery because of course the lead character in Star Trek Discovery was black and uh, yeah. not only that Chris. But there's someone who came out as non-binary in one of the episodes, oh and not only that, Chris, but there's a gay space fam as well, and like queer space fam. So of course you've got these um, these so-called Trekkies foaming at the mouth, uh, and like, uh, and you know what's brilliant though is when the community comes together and trolls them back. Yeah. So like, there's this one person who really was like, oh, you know, oh, like you're so woke, you like you got you come out as non-binary. We've got Michael Burnham, who's a Mary Sue, and all this kind of stuff. And then, um, and like hundreds and hundreds of people have replied to them with, with these me- various memes, basically saying, oh yeah, Trek was never political, and I've come in have, like my favorite one uh, is, yeah. um, is a giant, is a little, t- oh, it's from Star Trek Four, the one with the whales, uh, uh, where where they decloak the bird of prey over a whaling yacht over a whaling uh, ship <laughs> and the way on the, the meme says the meme's got the whaling ship is like the little people who say star trek was never political or, or trek has become woke and then the bird of prey the words over it says trek since 1960 yeah exactly <laughs> yeah i know people like you know they think yeah they think activism and, and differences are kind of a new phenomenon and it's it's crazy. It's like, where are you drawing the line on things being normal? Because was it last Tuesday? Was it a year ago? Was it years ago? <laughs> like, when, when did we stop? You know, when did things stop changing such so that you can feel comfortable? To- Heavy on the recency bias. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one thing uh, one thing that um, I've seen on Twitter very recently as well is, which is doing the rounds, which is quite good, it's 10 symptoms of the woke mind virus, right? So I love it when we push back. I love it when we push back on on these claims right that the woke like the woke blob there's someone put a a brilliant cartoon of the woke blob and they devour this person and spits them out and they're all covered in goo and then this person's going no 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 i have empathy oh yeah (laughs) that's brilliant i know it's kind of it's i mean it's like they can't define it even exactly if they could, it's not particular. i mean it they, uh, yeah i mean i mean it, w- one thing i i kind of learn is that it's a racially co-opted term as well it, yes not, i mean i mean to use it as a as a as a dismissive sort of term is 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 you know it, was, it came from the black community in the u.s right it's yeah. kind of you know to be white was to be alert to social injustice yeah. and, and- Inequality and and yet you know people are kind of tossing it around. It's kind of like, well, actually, no. I'm I'm proud to be woke because I I have all I have all these ten ten symptoms, right, Chris? It says number one, you read books and you don't burn them. (laughs) Number two, you embrace science. Number three, you are willing to change your mind when new information becomes available. Number four, you understand that most issues are not black and white. Number five, you believe in true equality for all people. Well, I I call that equity then. Uh, Six, you like to share. Seven, you embrace cooperation. (laughs) Eight, you respect other people's rights. Nine, you believe culture and the arts has value. Yes. And 10, you care for the planet and all of its life. So I have the woke mind virus, everybody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, anybody who's going to be like, I don't want to be any of those things. They're the same people who don't want to be told, you know, they can't drive their car along the kind of pedestrianized zone in a town center. You know, like it's kind of, it's, it's just any sort of, I just don't like being told what to do. Yes. Yeah. That we yeah. have laws which yeah. mean yeah. you can't do certain things, but right. you right. don't seem to mind those one. It's so <laughs> bizarre. I don't, I don't really understand where it comes from. Great. We, I do want to finish on one thing before we, we wrap up, and that is, um, as as we joked before we started recording, is that I think both me and you have, you know, from, from our own lived experiences and our own points of view and our worldviews, I think our, the Venn diagram of me and you is, is pretty closely overlapping, almost like an eclipse, right? But, but yes. I want yes. to talk about the bit that doesn't yes. overlap. Oh, right. Okay. Right? Yeah. No, we need to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Chris, I think pineapple belongs on pizza. You know what, though? I mean, I've been through this so many <laughs> times. I just, I just, I can't, I, like, it just, it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense because 
if you you can you can you can put like I'm gonna say it and people will tell me Go on. people do it. You do put it. grapes on pizza, right? <laughs> if you wanted to, or like slices of satsuma or watermelon. Or I mean, when 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 does it end? You know, when does <laughs> when does the madness end? Just and so I don't I don't quite know where it started. Well, I sort of do. So I've even the cats left. Like, I'm not even going to be in this discussion. The cats heard enough. <laughs> and I, you know, I've heard, I've, I've read about where it came from, and uh, you know, whatever. I who am I to tell? Like we're here talking about equality, equity, inclusivity. Who am I to tell people who they can and can't be? You want to put pineapple in pizza? Get like have a ball. <laughs> I, I think it tastes absolutely disgusting. Um, but, you know, I. And there's so many other toppings. Like, why, why have that? Anyway, that's my. That's the, the, the defense rests. Was it the prosecution? <laughs> Maybe it's the prosecution. <laughs> oh, is there any? Is there anything you have had on pizza where others might think is questionable? I'm, I'm not going to admit it now publicly, am I? Well, I yes, you are. <laughs> um, what I had on pizza that's been questionable. I don't think. I don't, honestly, I'm kind of like you know, kind of the missionary, the kind of missionary position of pizza <laughs> toppings. You know, it's kind of. <laughs> I've never that before. <laughs> you know, it's kind of. I'm not that adventurous, I guess. Um, I, I, so one thing I had, which is, so I lived in Brazil for a year in 2009, and there was a, it was a kind of churrascaria, like a barbecue place at the end of our street, and and it was one of these churrascarias that did pizzas as well, badly, but whatever, they did pizzas, <laughs> and there wasn't many other places near where we lived in Rio that did pizza, so I went there. And they had a um, a dessert pizza, which I'd never seen before. And like, if you want to stick pineapple on dessert pizza, be my guest, right? <laughs> Okay. Don't get, yeah, don't put it on tomato <laughs> sauce and ham. Like what? Um, so, so they had dessert pizzas and they had a chocolate spread and so Nutella as the the sauce replacement. Then okay. This, but then it had Smarties sprinkled on it, and then they put the yeah exactly. I can see you thinking. And then they <laughs> they put the you know they put it in the oven for uh, one minute or something. So the chocolate sauce melted, the Smarties melted slightly, and they brought it out. I mean, yeah. What do you reckon? As a dessert, yeah. Okay. Is it a pizza? Oh, by, I suppose by structure and construct, <laughs> yes. Yeah, but but as then, a concept, no, that, probably not. It's a pie. Any, any, is it a pie? Well, a pizza is a pie. No, this is where we get. Well, no, is, no, that's mm. Chicago pizza, right? So there's that, that's, in, I'm not even getting into that. <laughs> that is just like outright dangerous. <laughs> but like, if you, like, so is it any kind of, Thin bready, like flat bready type thing, and you put a savory or sweet sauce on it, and with toppings. Is that is mm. that is that? If it is, it's fine. Like I, I just misunderstood for forty six years what pizza <laughs> is. If it's you're that telling broad. me, Chris, because I'm married to an American, and like they complete. We're not what we say. Shep, when we say things like shepherd's pie and fisherman's pie and stuff like that, they're like, "What? That's not a pie." You know, it's like, a it pie. Is a pie. Yes, it's an American. <laughs> what? No. Exactly. So, you know, I think I think we're just confused. Um, but anyway. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, okay, that's brilliant. Yeah, one last thing, and that is uh linking you to our previous guest for uh, a little little thing we call We Are All Geographers, where the person the previous guest comes up with a word that you have to talk about for 30 seconds, ideally linking it into jog, but you can easily link this word to geology one hundred percent. You right? built it up now for me to kind of make it right. Yeah, no, I'm I am. I'm gonna I'm gonna build you up. Um, so I had uh, last week, I spoke to the absolute wonderful uh, Jasmine Qureshi, who is an absolute delight, a marine biologist, broadcast, uh, well, journalist, and she did a bit of broadcasting for CBBS and stuff like that. Um, and so I think, what did she get to do? She had to do the word T-shirt. As her <laughs> word. But um, you, she, you you're, you're, you're now this, it's a word that rhymes with nail as a geologist, and that's snail. Oh. Oh right, okay. So, so you got to talk snails for thirty seconds from the point of view of a geologist, if you like. Oh right. So a snail is an invertebrate. That is right, isn't it? <laughs> he panics immediately. Um, so it's an invertebrate, and they are um, found in gardens. And I assume that they like certain geographies over other geographies because geography gives us different environments. And mm. I think snails probably like damp slightly humid environment so they seek out those sorts of places like bushes and under heaps of compost um, <laughs> and the best place therefore for those snails to perhaps be is on 
easily weathering rocks. Mm. Some geologists get back to rocks. <laughs> easily weathering <laughs> rocks like soft sandstones and mudstones that produce a good soil, and therefore you would find lots of snails in oh, those sorts of regions, such as where I live here in Marple. There you go. Well, there you go. Yeah, that was that wasn't too bad, was it? <laughs> that wasn't too bad. I'm just thinking because um, I've been trying to get uh, Anjana on this uh, on this podcast. Oh, just, yes. And if you're listening, I don't know whether she's having a bit of a giggle now. She's got to be, surely. And like, John, yeah, fossils, some fossils. And John probably knows that there is an invertebrate like me who panics when he's like, "Is it a mammal? Is it a flightless bird? No, I think it's an invertebrate." And I also I mean, thought you said, you know, you usually find them on, and I was like, "Not don't say pizza, don't say pizza." Uh, well, French pizzas or like Spanish pizzas or Pyrenean pizzas. You know, they eat, they eat snails in lots of places. So brilliant. Oh, Chris, it's, I've, I've had such a <laughs> such a great laugh uh, so far, right? But you get to you get to choose the next word for the next guest. I, I have no idea who it's going to be yet. I still need to line them up. But um, but for when I get the next guest on, what word are you going to give them? I am obviously going to say granite. Yeah, excellent. You're grounding us now. We've had all these really exactly. weird stuff. We've had we've had toaster. We've had scissors. We've had tomato ketchup. We've had t-shirt. <laughs> You know, and the, when I first started this podcast, Chris, we were having really like that kind of like nuanced, abstract kind of things like hope and stuff. It was done oh, by right. David okay, Alcock, yeah. you know, but now now you, you're bringing it real. You're, you're bringing it. Bringing there it we real. go. <laughs> Granite. Excellent. Oh, Chris, it's been a fabulous chat. And um, a, a lot of people who listen to this podcast probably follow you already. But um, for those who do not yet, uh, where can people find you and follow you on social media? Uh, so on Twitter, I am at size underscore matters. So size underscore matters. That's S E I S underscore matters. Love it. Uh, size being related to seismic, yes. um, rather than anything more nefarious than that. <laughs> and uh, I am also. On... <laughs> I did. I did want to get told off for having that as my Twitter handle. Like, it's very chauvinistic, and I was like panicked for about two weeks. I was like, I just no, panicked. it's perfect. And then I didn't. Um, and uh, on Instagram at Christopher Aiden Lee Jackson, um, so all one word. Or oh, it might be Christopher dot Aiden dot Lee dot Jackson. Or yes, <laughs> I think there's dots there. Um, and don't go and find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. It's and just safe for everyone. <laughs> have you got anyone? To, you got anyone you want to give a shout out to? With my vain um, hope that they're listening. Oh, who? I don't know. A shout out to my mum. And shout yes. out to my wife who's taken the kids away. Though there's not <laughs> children. Well, actually, it's late now, so uh, the kids would have been tearing around in the background. And uh, <laughs> who else? I'll give a shout out to Ben Britton, my good friend who is now in Vancouver. I've not seen him for quite a long time, Aww. and I remembered him today because I was looking at his Instagram feed. And oh, bless him! There you go, ben. Well, oh, bless him. Well, yeah. Hi, Chris. And again, hi, Chris's mum. And as you've heard, hopefully you've listened to the whole thing now. And uh, no doubt Chris's phone's going to ring any second. Mum's saying, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I actually have to ring my mum in a moment because she's supposed to be so really. Bless. <laughs> oh, well, Chris, I've, it's been an absolute delight to actually get to talk to you for a bit. Um, I've, I admire you so much. Uh, as a human being, as a geographer, as a person. And I'm just so delighted that I'm able to connect with you and correspond with you. And uh, long may it continue, Chris, because you're, you're, you're a man off my own heart. Thank you. Thank you, Kit. No, it's been a, it's been a, been a huge honour being asked on. And yeah, likewise, I've learned a lot from today, you know, about lots of things that I otherwise wouldn't have come into contact with over oh. the last, you know, five or six years of kind of fairly committed twitter use on my part so yeah that's why that's why social media is can have benefits yeah absolutely and for for all for all the downsides the trolling anything like that it's allowed folks like myself and you to to you know well collaborate in one ways where we've where we've mm. kind of like joined forces to to talk about things but also just connect and and it's you know it's knowing folks like you're out there doing your thing it's just you know just keeps faith in humanity for me yeah i mean that genuinely i mean that all right thank you right uh so thank you thank you thank you so much for listening we hope you had fun if you haven't already done so please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favorite podcast app if you fancy being a guest or have any feedback follow us on Twitter at coffeejogpod and send us a DM. Or you could email coffeeandjog at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep geogging.